Hi, Shamika. Hi, Anthony. How are you? How are you? Apparently, when we start speaking, they say the noise will stop. No problem. Yeah, I understand. I think it's the feedback coming from the microphone in the room. Ah, okay. Now I am. I'm, it's so, it seems to be okay. Yeah, it stopped. That that was me. I just um, became the host and or co-host, and I've just muted um, IGF five. But that may mean that people in the room can't uh, participate. Sorry, Ed. Did you say you are mute the uh, room? I've just mute, mute, Yeah, I've just muted the IGF five room, which is where that sound was coming from. Um, which means that we don't have that sound in our ears, but the bad news is that those people wouldn't be able to participate now. Um, okay. Well, let's wait for the tech support to see what other solutions they have. They must have encountered this problem because it's already day two of the conference. So. Back again. So it must not be you then, uh, Ed. Uh, well, I think they unmuted themselves. Okay. Hi, no. Sof Sophora. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to speak. Maybe we could start. Can we start? Can you hear us in the room? Yeah, 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 we can hear you clearly. You can hear us clearly? Okay, that's yes. great. So I'll hang up. So Ed and Chamika, the, the tech has just mentioned that all is clear to commence. Yeah. Thank you, Sephora. Thank you. So welcome everybody um, for our next session. Apologies for the technical difficulties. My name is Anthony Wong. I'm actually dialing in from Sydney. And joining me today is uh, Ed Santo, who's the former Australian High Human Rights Commissioner. And he's also joining us from Sydney. And also joining us from Geneva is uh, Shamika, who heads the UN Secretariat for Science and Technology for Development and also Director UNTAG. So welcome to our panelists and speakers. Um, my apologies again for the let's start. Um, so before I, I start with my session, there's three parts to the, the session. And what I like to do is uh, after I speak, I will hand over to Ed to talk about the human rights development and then to Shamika to talk about from the uh, developing countries perspective. And then we have opening to the floor for questions. Before I start, I'd just like to introduce IFIP, who is uh, coordinating this conference today, uh, the session on ethics and regulation of artificial intelligence. IFIT was established in 1960 under the auspices of UNESCO. We incorporated in Austria and our mission statement is to achieve the worldwide professionalism and social responsible development and application of ICT. So hence, that's why we're hosting this event today, and which is a very important session. Uh, we have members across five continents of the world ranging from BCS in the UK to Australian Computer Society, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, Brazil. So we have members across the five continents. And just a quick intro, uh, we all come from very di different backgrounds, from academia to a professional practice. Uh, and last year in 2021, we celebrated our 60th anniversary and we hosted a program of more than 50 events online through the COVID pandemic across five continents of various topics. We look at issues from the, from the Northern to the South, to the East and West. 
and uh, to celebrate our, our, our anniversary. So thank you everybody for joining us today. I just like to quickly mention that, uh, that this issues with ethics in, of artificial intelligence and regulation uh, is, is more than artificial intelligence itself. The, the topic is also about emerging technologies. AI is obviously a key enabler of that, and especially now with the multiverse coming online. So with all this combination of emerging tech, including virtual reality, augmented reality blockchain, and many other emerging techs, we are seeing them interacting and merging, creating a rather complex uh, area for ethical and legal regulatory challenges, which I'll briefly go through today. Uh, just to introduce the topic, recently when I spoke at the Law Asia conference on IP and AI, I found that we already have even ma magazine covers like Cosmopolitan, which are now created purely through artificial intelligence uh, with art designed for the cover of this magazine. We also seen recently uh, how AI was used to generate it, to generate and complete the unfinished symphony of Beethoven, the 10th symphony, uh, with the AI learning from all his works over the many years. And also we've looked at the Rembrandt project uh, with the master of art, Rembrandt, uh, looking to create new work from Rembrandt, learning for all his paintings over the years. Perhaps more interestingly, uh, just recently, was Robert Ida giving evidence to the House of Lords inquiry, particularly to do with creative future inquiry at the House of Lords. You will see a painting of the late queen uh, that was painted by Ida Robot herself without uh, much other human intervention. So this, this particular inquiry to the House of Lords uh, created obviously some controversy because it's one of the first in the world, but it also shows to you the, the shaping of where we're going with the technology. So my, my presentation is, is really a collective of series of things that I've done over the last few years. Been writing a column on the Australian on AI uh, for a number of years. And this talk, short session that I'm giving is really a compilation of a number of lectures I've given in Australia, Cambodia, on employment, in, in other parts of Asia, at Geneva at WISIS, and Brazil and Sri Lanka and Zimbabwe in Africa. And also you can get uh, more details of my talk on the two publication from Springer, which I've listed on, on this page. As I mentioned, uh, I spoke in Cambodia recently on AI and, and employment, employment law, and I know that Shamika will be speaking uh, on the, the the perspective of the developing country shortly. Uh, and and this particular issues with employment in in uh, in developing countries were mentioned in the recent report by UNTAC on technology innovation 2021. And I noticed there was a huge coverage on, on labor and labor skills and robots and AI replacing uh, labor in, in developing countries. So I'd just like to highlight uh, when I gave this talk in Cambodia, uh, from statistics from the International Labour Organization. We look at how the robots and artificial intelligence might displace or might displace uh, workers working in the field in the ASEAN region. And recently I spoke on IP and AI at the Law Asia Conference in Sydney uh, on particular AI, which was also briefly touched on by UNTAC's report on technology and innovation, particularly in terms of the diffusion and the sharing of intellectual property from the north to the south. So quickly moving to the areas of ethics, 
a uh, few years ago, I look at the number of athletes, and this particular site looks at the comparative analysis of the different principles from three different frameworks, from the Australian athletes perspective, and looking at the EU perspective, and also from the perspective of the intellectual uh, IT law association perspective. And you can see they cover very similar fields, except for a few areas, uh, the traditional, the privacy, no harm, regulatory compliance, transparency, accountability, discrimination, and fairness. But in 2022, when I did a, my paper, which is now being published by Springer, I also look at this particular study by, by Felt. We're looking at a study where they look at 36 principles across the board, and they identified eight areas for commonality. And you can see from the perspective on the slide, uh, how one particular area is, is much more mentioned than others. Fairness, particularly in discrimination, is in 100% of those principles that were looked at, including privacy at 97%. But what about ethics? Uh, in one of my talks, I actually gave a talk to a Buddhist institute where they talk ethics. And that was a perspective for me because I had to share my technology and legal perspective on AI to a group of, of Buddhist uh, learning ethics in the area of their faith. And that really struck me uh, in terms of the diversity about ethics. And, and fortunately for us, in the recent uh, declaration by UNESCO, which was adopted by 193 member states just in November last year, uh, on ethics, you look at the four different values that's been enunciated in that declaration alone. So they're pretty broad. They cover ranging from environment, ecosystem, to diversity, inclusiveness, uh, peacefulness, and internet interconnected society, and respect for human rights and dignity. The Ethics from UNESCO declaration covers 10 principles. They are pretty broad and they've extended past the what I've shown you in the previous principles across the, the board. Uh, pretty broad perspective. And here we look at number 10 particularly, which is perhaps new from the principal perspective, looking at really multi-stakeholder engagement. In, in the formulation of the principle and the governance and collaboration. In terms of the policy areas covered by the UNESCO declaration, also covering 11 areas of policy, uh, very much broader than what, what's in the typical, uh, typical uh, frameworks that we've seen in the past. And particularly recently, uh, we've just, just last month alone, the US White House has released a blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights. Uh, I think when we look at the Bill of Rights, we need to know that this is not actually law. This is another voluntary framework and it covers a broad areas of principles uh, in the area of AI for, for the US, from the, particularly from the White House. So where are we with the ethics framework and, and in terms of where we're moving on to next? I think the biggest challenge for us now is to look at how do we translate and embrace uh, those values into action. And I think Ed will be talking more about that when he, he speaks at the next session. I think the debate uh, that we've seen since 2017 on ethics and frameworks have matured significantly. We look at the principles have broadened significantly to cover a lot of uh, human rights issues, uh, issues to do with inclusiveness, uh, sharing of technology and innovation. But then the challenge still remain, how do we actually operationalize and implement this in terms of actually putting into effect and how we actually, when we look at designing and developing AI systems. So with this new trend, we're seeing now a trend particularly to legal and law 
the development around the AI area, uh, moving from the ethical practice to a more rule-based uh, compliance area. So looking at the wider system over the last year, particularly 2022 and 2021, we've seen uh, more than 60 countries have developed policies on AI in this area. We've seen a number of laws starting to be proposed, and I'll go to one or two of those just to illustrate to you where we're at. And we see numerous AI standards been developed and an assessment framework, and also many professional societies such as IFIP and the ACM are starting to look at kind of ethics for professional practice. But in particular, I'd like just to spend some time uh, looking at this regulatory developments. Uh, the UNESCO recommendation, uh, it, it said in one of their principle, one of their declaration statements about this uh, principles, that this they're hoping that their framework of values and principles that we've just seen and the action policy areas will be used by member states, all the 193 country in the member states to when they come to do with actually developing and drafting their legislation in this area. So also just quite recently this year, we've seen Canada actually proposing a, a new law on artificial intelligence and data, and also the US uh, also announced a revision of their previously uh, proposed law on the Algorithmic Accountability Act. But perhaps significantly in the legal space, in 2021, the EU, after many years of debate, have moved to propose draft legislation in this AI area, and that has there are lots of debates going on in the EU Parliament and the Council, particularly to this complex area of law with regulating artificial intelligence in the European Union. So recently I look at the new version uh, that's been proposed by the Czech during the Czech presidency of the EU. Uh, they've looked at some significant changes. And as a result, we're seeing there potentially be some delays in getting this particular legislation through the EU. Currently, the dates are proposed to be late next year or the early year after. So particular challenge is the definition of artificial intelligence, which has gone through many iteration. And with the latest iteration from November 2022, we've seen the revised draft changes substantially from what was previously uh, drafted to include areas like elements of autonomy. So the question then is what are elements of autonomy uh, required for the legislation EU in the EU to be triggered to cover regulation of artificial intelligence? Um, so I think this area in terms of definition will be hugely Debated for for many years to come because AI itself is developing as fast as we can speak to, and and UNESCO in their declaration they have decided not to adopt a definition. Uh, from the IT perspective, I would say that's a wise decision. But speaking also as a lawyer, it would be very difficult to regulate AI if we don't have a, a robust definition of it artificial intelligence moving forward. In the US alone, there's no federal legislation in the area, apart from the one that I've just mentioned, which has been proposed, uh, the US Algorithmic Accountability Act 2022, uh, mentioned previously that's been uh, proposed, I think in 2019, this is a new version of this particular draft. Um, the U.S. states themselves have many laws now to do with AI, from recruitment to, to facial recognition laws or biometrics, from tasting uh, drive, self-driving cars to ultimate decision-making by authorities. So these are just some of the snapshots of what's happening in the regulatory space. So some of my concluding remarks around this area. I, I believe government industries have important roles in the creation policies 
and regulatory frameworks. But what we've seen are countries are now at different levels of AI ecosystem maturity. Uh, the area of regulation is still very much in its infancy. It's fragmented and it's changing, and that's likely going to go for for many years to come. Uh, some of the difficulties that I mentioned, uh, different AI is now being created across many walks of life, and it covers many fields. Uh, they pose different risks, different benefits, and they create different issues. So compounding that with the different emerging technologies not just AI from multiverse, metaverse to IoT, uh, blockchain and many others, we're seeing that it's just not going to be easy to regulate something which is just moving as fast as we can draft legislation. So it's a complex area. Uh, many countries are still not looking at the areas of liability. I think this is still very new. Uh, we know about explainability and transparency because it's been covered by a lot of those uh, ethical frameworks moving past. But I can see in terms of my concluding remarks because of the complex modeling and machine algorithms that we have and the learning from data, that's going to create a, a big complexity uh, moving forward to regulate AI. But whatever the case, I think we're going to see likely going to be more of those laws coming in the future. So my last slides, what are my three three uh, last concluding remarks? This AI matter is causing a major paradigm shift. There will be substantive change in the law in relation to the principles of what our law is based on, uh, particularly when we have machines and tools which now starting to learn from data adapt and make decisions, which I say in quotation, and learning from experience, which I also quote in quotations, uh, because we are not really to the stage of being sentient at this stage or will ever be in, in the near future. The pace of technology, my second point that I've mentioned, because it's moving so fast that it would be challenging to regulate something that's moving as fast as we can put pen to paper. So, but then the, the challenge is people are negatively impacted by AI decisions. And, and, and obviously, even if we had laws, it'd be difficult for them to challenge because of the complexity and technical around AI and emerging technologies. So on that regard, I will finish my, my introduction statement and like now to pass over to Ed, Ed, the former Human Rights Commissioner of Australia. Ed, I'll start sharing my screen. Uh, happy for you now to take over, Ed, to talk about uh, the human rights and the technology discourses that you've worked on over the last few years. Well, thank you very much, Anthony, for that warm introduction. Um, it's a great pleasure to join you. Um, I'm speaking from Australia. Uh, but I must observe that this event is being hosted physically in Ethiopia. Uh, and I've received a number of representations from members of the Tigrayan diaspora community expressing deep concern about this event being held in Ethiopia, given the ongoing conflict. Um, I'll speak very briefly on indulgence um, about that. Um, I note that in September this year, the UN Human Rights Council received a report from the International Commission of Human Rights Experts in Ethiopia, which found reasonable grounds to believe war crimes and crimes against humanity had been committed, especially in the Tigray region. I certainly don't claim any special knowledge about these matters um, beyond what has been publicly reported, but I do respectfully acknowledge uh, the representations of deep concern that I have received. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll return to um, the, the focus of, of my observations um, about artificial intelligence. So uh, in my former role as Human Rights Commissioner for Australia, I led a major project on the human rights and broader social implications of AI. Uh, over three years, we undertook um, what, what I understand to be the most extensive public consultation anywhere in the world on what the rise of AI meant for us as a community here in Australia, but perhaps more broadly as well. Um, I want to start with a few key insights from that consultation. The first 
which I found fascinating, was that people uh, told us that they were, or well, at least they felt like they were living in two very different worlds at the same time. Uh, and those were utopian and dystopian worlds. <laughs> On one hand, they could see how AI and other emerging technologies could make their lives better. For example, for improvements in communication, computing, precision medicine, uh, there's an almost endless list. Um, take, for example, people who are blind or have a vision impairment. Um, if uh, you have a smartphone, you can hold your smartphone up um, and almost literally, you can see the world around you. You can have it described to you. Uh, people who were blind uh, reported to us that that was uh, almost revolutionary change for the better. Um, and that is hugely exciting because the artificial intelligence that makes that possible um, is uh, becoming more widely available. On the other hand, uh, people are increasingly becoming aware uh, and reported to us their awareness of the risks and threats of harms associated with artificial intelligence. Um, perhaps the greatest concern or the most common concern that was raised with us in lay terms was essentially this, and we heard this many, many times, people saying to us, I'm just starting to realize that my personal information can be used against me. It's quite a profound concern because what it, speaks to is the idea that um, our personal data is indeed um, what is fueling the rise of AI. Um, and with phenomena like algorithmic bias, which can lead to unfairness, indeed, even unlawful discrimination, um, that can um, uh, involve decisions that are deeply unfair um, and, and sometimes un unlawful based on things that you can't control. Uh, the protected attributes are referred to in Article 26 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, such as your age or your gender or your race or skin colour and so on. There was also concern that the availability and, and especially the benefits of AI were not evenly distributed across the community. I'm conscious that Shemika will explore that phenomenon from a developing country perspective, so I don't want to steal her thunder. But even in a wealthy country like Australia, uh, one's socioeconomic status was important in determining one's experience of AI and other new technology. As uh, a number of people have observed with every um, industrial revolution, um, there is a, a dispiriting phenomenon, and that is that the new technology tends to be beta tested on uh, the most vulnerable people um, in our community. And uh, in too many ways, that has indeed been the case. Uh, here in Australia, uh, we have a number of examples of um, debt collection uh, um, of initiatives that have been done by uh, federal and state governments um, that have targeted um, vulnerable people. Uh, there's been an enormous amount of literature from um, especially North America and Europe um, identifying similar problems. Um, and that, that is something I think we need to be focused on. So in terms of charting a way forward, there was uh, skepticism, um, sometimes quite deep skepticism in uh, the community about the discourse on AI and ethics. Um, the notion that companies and governments should look primarily to their own ethical principles to address legitimate concerns, such as those that I've referred to about equality, privacy, and other human rights, seemed to many people um, like an excuse for inaction. Indeed, um, there have been over 500 AI ethics frameworks or, or sets of AI ethics principles that have been developed over the last five years. Uh, and I'll come back to this, this point. Um, there is value in, those, in that work. Don't get me wrong, but the empirical research to date that has sought to assess the impact of those ethical frameworks or ethical principles is stark. It suggests that um, those ethics principles tend to have no discernible impact at all. And so we need to look um, at what we can do to make those ethics principles more um, effective, but we also need to look beyond uh, that kind of ethics as a solution. So with that backdrop, and this is the last thing I'll say in, in my prepared remarks, uh, the Australian Human Rights Commission published a major report, um, and we worked with a number of other national human rights institutions around the world 
um, in this regard. Um, I'll just pull out three key recommendations and findings. Um, the first is that um, the primary duty of states um, and the international community more broadly is to ensure compliance with international human rights law in the development and use of AI. Um, so the proper role of AI ethics frameworks is to provide guidance where the law is silent or unclear. Secondly, we challenged uh, the idea that um, we are right now living in a uh, digital wild west, um, which I guess is another way of saying that there are no laws that apply to AI and other emerging technology. Our view, on the contrary, was that international and domestic human rights law is in fact applicable and can be well adapted to the development and use of AI. Um, the main problem, however, has been a failure to apply or enforce those laws rigorously, effectively and consistently. Um, we certainly um, did not oppose um, the development and use of artificial intelligence, but we did say that governments and companies needed to pay greater heed to their legal and especially their human rights obligations when it comes to the development and use of AI. And that essentially boiled down to applying three key principles. In the development and use of AI, it must always be fair, it must always be accurate, and it must always be accountable. So with that, I'm going to end my uh, prepared remarks and, and hand back to our chair. Thank you, Ed, for, for that great uh, discourse on technology and human rights. Uh, before I pass this back to the questions, I'd like to introduce uh, Samika. Uh, head of Secretariat to the UN Commission for Science and Technology for Development will be sharing with us the perspective on from the developing countries. Shamika, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. I um, just uh, let me start saying I think what you both said that, that we live in a time of rapid technological change and Ed, you even said that it could be the wild, wild west kind of scenario. So in this challenging times, the question that should be in everyone's mind, those in governments, private sector and academia, is how to be competitive in this ever-changing world of technology and at the same time contribute to the ethical, inclusive and sustainable transformations that are so badly needed in our world. You see, according to, just to give you an understanding, kind of a picture of how fast these technologies are moving, According to estimates, technologies such as AI, robotics, IoT, blockchain, and other technologies associated with the so-called Industry 4.0 represented a 350 billion US dollar market in 2020. And some suggest, and we have some estimates to say that it could grow to over 3.2 trillion dollars by 2025. Huh? So, so within five years from 350 billion market dollar market to a 3.2 trillion dollar market so this is how fast and they go uh, so th this new technology wave uh, will further enhance human interaction with mobile task based ever present technology it will also enable interaction with technology coupled on human and machine partnerships augmenting our potential. I mean, Ed, you mentioned many areas where there can be amazing opportunities that the AI could bring. But then, as you both said, that there are grave concerns about the ethical application of AI. We know very well biases within AI systems has arisen in several ways, either because they employ biased algorithms or use biased data for training. So they are all both not good, but they are, that's the reality. So there is this one study found that being signed into a Google account as a woman reduced the likelihood of seeing advertisements for higher paying positions. So take me, for example, I'm a woman and I have a very strange name and I go on Google and, uh, you know, I'm dark and I go on Google and I look for a job. I will not be, you know, not be shown these higher paying positions. So I would then like to make two points for consideration for all of you and pose two questions around these issues. Now, first, AI algorithms are being developed on data sets and contexts that mostly leave out the people, as was the example, the Google example, the economies and the cultures of developing countries. 
In the current state of affairs, AI tools can create even more acute power asymmetries in international relations. I mean, this is something that we are handling in UNCTAD. For example, if they are used to support multilateral negotiations. So my first question is the following. Given that AI does not currently reflect most of the world, is it ethical to allow it to have an increasing role in managing global systems? So this is a question I would like to pose to you. You know, we all know that it is critical to establish ethical frameworks and regulations for these technologies. I, you know, Anthony, you uh, told us what's being done and where these things are, uh, uh, you know, where the progress is. So for two years ago, we at UNCTAD, we kind of painstakingly gathered ethical frameworks and guidelines for AI. And this was for our technology and innovation report. Anthony, you mentioned that we issued in 2021. And we found 167 ethical frameworks. And these are mostly done by private sector firms and some academics. And we also found inconsistencies and contradictions. And it was very clear that there is a need for a more comprehensive and coherent framework. So based on that finding, my second point for consideration for all of you is that in the absence of an effective international normative framework, most developing countries are left without real alternatives for AI regulation. The only option available is for them to adopt frameworks developed by others, like you, the, the, that you mentioned in the US and Canada and the EU, and these are not you know, totally out of context for low-income countries, or self-regulation by the platforms that control the data used to feed algorithm. And that's not an option either. Perhaps, I think, uh, Anthony, we started having this discussion. Maybe we need to explore more. Perhaps an alternative is to adopt an open innovation approach for AI, in which inputs, methods, and results of the innovation are shared openly with the teams, and then the teams can use them for further innovation and also serve as additional pair of eyes to ensure ethical AI. So this is a bit like open source, uh, you know, open source software development. But if you bring teams and the teams define, you know, teams from across the world, they define the uh, a question that they want to raise, and then they work together and develop AI systems. And this is transparent and it is openly shared. And I think there will be a lot more ethical AI will be born in this kind of process. So my second question to you is, can an open innovation approach for AI offer an alternative model which is more amenable to the ethical imperatives that matter for developing countries? And this is not something I can do in UNCTAD, but this is something that I feel may perhaps can you know, take into consideration and try to see what work can be done in this area. Thank you, Shamika, for that uh, illuminating area on from the developing countries perspective. And that question, I'd like to get uh, Ed to go first to answer that question, and I'll be happy to go next. Ed, um, Shamika talk about open innovation approach for AI. Yeah, look, I, I think that that's a very um, important uh, way of framing um, a, a move towards equality. Um, I think uh, open innovation, um, I think, looks very clearly at um, what, what are the barriers to the spread of um, the technical capability um, when it comes to developing and then using AI um, and, and tries to, to break down those barriers. So um, on that point, I'm in complete agreement with Shamika. Um, but I do want to pick up another point that Shamika made. Um, which I think is worth exploring a little bit further. Um, I, the, the observation that Shemekha made was, was that there's no normative framework for artificial intelligence. And I think in one sense, that's absolutely true. Um, but in another sense, um, perhaps it's, th th there's something hiding in plain, plain sight. Um, what I mean by that is artificial intelligence on the whole, 99.9% .9 of use cases for AI are, uh, um, essentially things that we have always done, but we're doing them in new ways. And that's why I said before that existing law 
um, including international human rights law, um, is well adapted um, to the, uh, the, 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 the situation of the rise of AI. And so I would say that the normative framework for AI is our normative framework for human rights, um, because, uh, you know, to take a, an illustration, um, for uh, hundreds of years, um, uh, we have uh, made decisions um, about um, giving loans to people, um, you know, maybe thousands of years. Um, and, and previously we, we did that using abacuses and so on. And now um, banks are doing that um, using some of the most sophisticated forms of artificial intelligence. But the ultimate decision itself is the same. It is to uh, provide someone a, a loan or, or not a loan. Um, and uh, the, the, the legal requirements, um, in other words, the normative framework that underpins that, it, things like, you know, you shouldn't deny someone a home loan on the basis of their gender or their skin colour or, or whatever it happens to be. And so I would say that should be our normative framework um, because it's already there. It's already agreed. And it's really a matter of more rigorously applying those rules. Thank you, Van, for that response. Uh, Shamika, happy to, to give an IFIT perspective and also from my legal perspective on the innovation framework approach. From the IFIT perspective, we, we do have many working groups working across the world, looking from both the academic and technical and practice issues uh, from different uh, backgrounds and different cultures. So that is something I can offer the UN and UNTAC and the world uh, to further that collaboration uh, using that vehicle for uh, innovative approaches, looking at new ways of diffusing uh, technology innovation to developing countries. Uh, as you have already said in my opening statement, uh, the mission statement of IFA since its creation, it's about the responsible deployment of ICT. And I see uh, as one of our goals to do with the open innovation approach, sharing technology, sharing discussion, sharing knowledge, uh, encouraging skills and education development, not just developed countries, but in developing countries around the world. And that we have done for many years with our technical committee three on education. Uh, we have many other technical committees working on many issues that we've just discussed from AI to uh, blockchain and IoT and so forth, and particularly now quantum computing. From my, my personal perspective uh, as an ICT practitioner and ex-CIO as well as now a practicing IT lawyer, I, I think we now need to look at uh, Shamika from your perspective as head of secretariat to the UN uh, Commission of Science and Technology for Development, we now need to work with WIPO in terms of who is going to own work created by artificial intelligence. Who is going to create, who's going to be allowed to patent uh, AI creations? Who, who do they belong to? Uh, because I think they are very significant. We're talking about IP being used to regulate, manage, and provide payback for people who make those creations and innovations. Yet we need to balance that with your perspective from your report about how do we diffuse that technology to developing countries because they do need that for inclusiveness, diversity, to further develop, otherwise they'd be left out in this huge digital divide. So I think it's going to be the discussion at this international level, and I think we need to put that in one of the action coming out of this session today, that wide discussion. Uh, right now, from the, the last week thing I did at the Law Asia on IP and, and AI, right, right now, no AI can be called an author of AI creations, whether it's an art or an NFT or, or so forth. Uh, no one can patent uh, uh, 
a creation created by artificial intelligence at this stage, no in the US, no in Australia, no in the UK, many parts of the world. There is still time to adjust what is the new rights going to be. Is this going to be a new sui generous right that we create for things created by AI? And maybe there's a component that we need to say that it should be licensed at equity levels to developing countries and less developed countries to make sure we even out this digital divide. So I think there's huge conversations coming out. Uh, that conversation needs to start. And I think a good place uh, to start is, is with your commission, uh, Shamika. Uh, if we can put that and work with you to put that in the report. But I think it's essential that we do need to work with WIPO because currently uh, those things are regulated by intellectual property laws. So we need to be mindful about the balance. So definitely AI is creating a disruption in this area. So it's good to have an open discussion. How do we move forward so that this new technology, including metaverse and, and quantum computing in the near future, could be uh, equitably shared with other developing countries, if not for free, at least with some sort of equity payment at, at the level that the developing countries can afford. So this is my, my legal IP uh, perspective. Um, Okay, thank you, Anthony. Can I just jump in here? So uh, let me yeah. offer you, as you said, I think this less, this uh, conversation we began today about the open innovation approach for AI, let's take it to the Commission on Science and Technology for Development because that's the UN's focal point for uh, having a, this sort of conversation. And it is meeting uh, at ministerial level at the la in the last week of March. So we will organize an event and we will bring, I think, as you said, the WIPO and other agencies need to be there because there are a lot of issues that we need to figure out as we go forward. So let's start this journey. Start from today from, and then we continue in Geneva at the end of March. And let's see how we can, you know, uh, figure out uh, the, this open innovation approach on AI so that the developing countries can also benefit from this amazing technologies coming our way. Excellent, uh, Shamika. Very happy to be supportive from the IFIT perspective, and I'm sure many people will be, be wanting to join that conversation as well. Perhaps I'd like to draw another one about uh, before we, we go to the next question, uh, Shamika, and getting questions from the floor with Simon and Sofera are uh, uh, canvassing at this moment. Uh, I know we're running out of time, but I'd just like to quickly say, when I gave the talk on employment on AI in Cambodia a few years ago in the developing country, it just struck me that with the robots and AI coming on, a lot of these people who are doing garments and law uh, manufacturing jobs will be displaced. And I noticed that in your technology innovation report, I think we need to work with the ILO uh, to update their report because this technology is going to displace. And we need to look at how to use this technology to help them move forward rather than move backwards. So that's a brief comment on that. Uh, now I'd like to move to the next question, which has been proposed by Ed. Uh, Ed, would you like to propose your question so that Jamaica and I can talk onto the question, please? Certainly. Um, so the, the question I've posed is really getting into this um, role of AI and ethics. So I think that the discussion on artificial intelligence and ethics has helped set a vision for AI, um, focusing on important principles like fairness, uh, equality of access and accountability. But our challenge is to move from principle to practice. Um, so if we accept what I said before, which is that on the whole, AI ethics principles may have galvanized us at some conceptual level, but are not driving change. What um, do we need to do to drive change? In other words, what are the practical steps that we need to take to ensure that our ethical commitments on AI drive real change? So maybe I'll ask Shamika to go first and I'll go next. Shamika? You know, uh, let me tell you, I'm an economist, so I don't really know the ethics of uh, AI as per se, but I think, Ed, what you mentioned, 
the human rights charter it is all you said that it is there it's out in the open it's it's hidden in the open i think that's the basis i totally fully agree but how do we begin i think that's also a conversation we need to begin because i think at the moment people are not going into the human rights charter though it is there and it is basically what the ai ethics is all about you know but i don't think people are and especially the private sector companies who are in the forefront of creating these technologies i don't think they even know the human uh, rights charter exists so how do we educate and build awareness and bring them back to the charter because charter is our answer from my perspective at uh, if you look at all the principles that we've seen coming from the north us and uk from the private industry hardly and some of them did mention societal impacts and environment but very few talks about human rights issues yeah so that's an interesting perspective and i think that the horse ad has bolted uh now that we have many countries now starting the dialogue on actually regulation passing laws yeah i think it's now a conjunction with laws and ethics when the law do have a gap but i think the time has passed when we just totally purely rely on ethical frameworks because those things have proven not to to work too well because it lacked the enforcement mechanism to give remedies to people who have been disadvantaged or have suffered damages as a result of artificial intelligence um we're going to see that more coming through in the near future this thing's not going to end uh so i think uh the legislative in the world it's going to react to those those chaos and and issues coming out and they're going to regulate so even as a lawyer i would say we need to be careful how we regulate and if you look at the eu scenario it's taking them many years to get to this stage and they're still debating on that so it's it's a very complex area as i said in my presentation the horse is bolted we've moved past ethics now ethics still has a role to play where there's a gap uh but i think regulatory things are on the horizon and it's going to get serious as time goes on thank you any last comment There's a question that is a question before we move to Simon for questions from the floor no no you you go ahead that Simon uh, and Sofera do you have questions for the floor in the room i'm seeing the people in the room sorry uh are there any questions from the floor whether it's online or people attending in, in the room So Farah, can you see any questions? Can you hear me? So we don't have yes, we can hear you. I guess maybe there is a question online. Simon Kwan. Oh, we have a question uh, from. Uh, uh, can you post your question to us from online? Okay, colleagues, do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, thank you. My question to Shamika. Thanks a lot. It's very interesting presentations. But uh, what is your uh, how say suggestion? Because uh, um, deriving this uh, how say experience, that's so many different approaches uh, for establishing ethic codex establishing regulations it depends from how say country by country region for by region but uh, does it how it possible to apply somehow this innovation approach as you say because uh, from my point of view main differences uh, lay on the how say legislations uh, uh, ground for example legislations uh, for some uh, community of United uh, European Union or uh, Commonwealth British or Chinese, it will be so different. It's a very similar uh, issue for the ethics approach or ethics codex, for example, for some Arabian countries, African countries, Australia or China. Uh, 
they it could be difference. So how we could align it? it it's really a challenges uh, issues. That's why I ask you maybe to, what do you mean when it says we need uh, some um, innovative approach? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me answer very shortly. You see, I think, uh, as you said, the, these governance and regulatory approaches are done by, you know, different uh, national governments and mostly in the West, uh, because this is an issue for them. And this is, has not come into low income countries to begin doing regulations and ethics. But the, the point is, this is, a, this is, you know, we are living through a technological revolution. And it is going to change not just uh, people in the uh, uh, you know few countries that have ethics and regulations, but it's going to affect all our lives. So the conversations need to be at a global level, as to have inclusive global conversation and global governance systems. So this is a must. I mean, there's only one inclusive uh, place huh, where everybody has a seat. That's the UN. Maybe it's you know 190 plus countries coming together and. Getting something done is not easy, but that's the place where everybody has one voice. So in that, that's the it's, it's in the UN and the inclusive global governance need to be had. The concern that we have is, you know, developing countries are not in the frontier of making any of these technologies, but they are going to be affected by them. So at the tables where the governance uh, uh, conversations are having, where the conversations are taking place, of the directions of these technologies, developing countries need to have a seat. So that seat is only there in the United Nations. Thank you, Shamika, and I totally agree. Uh, there are lots of vehicles in the UN area, so we should channel this conversation where all the countries can participate. So definitely IFIB and our, our stakeholders would look forward to contribute Shamika to, to that conversation. So ladies and gentlemen, I think there is another group waiting to use the room now. I'm sorry we had to start late because of the buzzing noise, but uh, we can carry on for a couple of days just on that conversation. But I'm sure when Shamika gets to organize the session, uh, people can log on from any parts of the world and actually listen to the conversation that's in, in place. So on that note, I'm sorry we don't have time to have another question but i uh, love to, to have another session at another period. And thank you for participating. It's been a most interesting session and I think uh, there are a lot more discussion as we move forward. So, so ladies and gentlemen, uh, good night from Sydney, Australia and Shamika, good night, uh, good afternoon to you and to good afternoon to those present at the, the forum. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. And we'll catch up soon. Thank you. Yeah, bye bye.